We're all ready, y'all. All right. Uh, Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. And I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting or drunkenness, not in chambering or wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and do not make provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. The word of God for the people of God. Father in heaven, we thank you today, Lord God, for this opportunity that you've given us once again, Father, to come before you, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for even us, allowing us to see another year, God. And so we thank you for the mercy, the grace that you have uh, bestowed upon us in this past year, year. And we thank you for today, God, asking you to speak to our hearts, that you would prepare our hearts to receive your word, God. I pray that every distraction will be pushed aside as we hear your word, that our focus and attention will be upon you. And we ask today that you give us eyes to see, ears to hear what you have to say to us. Give us understanding, courage, and wisdom to apply your word to our lives, Lord, that your name might be glorified by our living, Father. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. It's time. It's time. Paul, writing to the Romans, he said, look, knowing that the time, you know, it's high time to wake out of sleep. The night is far spent. He says, it's time. To, it's time. And I want to talk about that because um, just from the, from the subject or the topic of it's time. And I want you to think and let God speak to your hearts because, you know, God's spoken to me about some things. Um, you know, sometimes we have things that we, we tend to say, especially when we um, you know, have a little knowledge of religion or maybe we walk with the Lord and, you know, and we hear people say things like, you know, hey, the Lord is dealing with me about this and the Lord is talking to me about this and the Lord working on me about this. And sometimes it's time to just go ahead on and uh, get with it. <laughs> it's time to go ahead and just do it and stop, you know, uh, putting off. And I think that that's one of the things that Paul is talking about here that, hey, you know, we need to recognize what's going on and it's time to stop putting things off. Um, I used to tell those guys at the jail, I said, you know what, if you say that I'm going to give my life to the Lord tomorrow, I'm going to live for God tomorrow, you may as well say never because tomorrow is not promised, right? The only time we have is not just, even, not even the rest of the day. We only have right now. And so let's talk, let's talk about it. It's time, first of all, I think it's time to get serious about the Christian life, serious about living for God. It's time to be serious about it, not just kind of give it a little passing motion, notion that I go to church and, and I kind of hang out with, you know, I don't do some of the things I used to do, but it's time to get serious. Serious about being who God wants us to be, about this Christian life. And, you know, I mean, if we're going to have Christian success, and, and, and in, my, in my book, Christian success is living out God's purpose for your life and having a character and the works that he wants you to accomplish. If we're going to have this Christian success, then we are going to have to put forth effort and we're going to have to have a desire and we're going to have to put forth effort. You know, desire is only half the thing. You know, many times we have a lot of desires. And, and look, I, I can tell you, I have, I have desires. I mean, if, if I had put forth the effort in, one, in some of my desires, I'd probably be, you know, like Brick House Brown or something. But, uh, you know, I got the desire, but I, I didn't put forth the effort, right? I mean, you know, I mean, we were talking to a lady last night, and she was like, ooh, exercising is so addictive. You know, I'm like, you know, I was thinking, like, chocolate cake was more addictive, you know, to me. But, um, I mean, you know, I had more, I had, a, I had a desire for that, and I put forth the effort. It was easy. But look, if we're going to accomplish God's will, if we're going to do his work, have this Christian success, we're going to have to have a desire, and we're going to have to put forth the effort. And God works those things in us, and we need to cooperate. Right. You know, there's something that is said that, you know, salvation, being saved is that, you know, I don't help God save me, but he saves me. You know, when Peter was sinking in the, in the ocean and the water and he was drowning, he said, Lord, save me. He didn't help the Lord save him. God, reached, Jesus reached out and pulled him out. He saved him. You know, and it is, it's a one sided work in that sense. But when we talk about actually, you know, becoming better and better as a Christian and, and in perfecting the Christian life and the things that God wants you to do. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a synergistic work. It's cooperation between us and God that we got to cooperate with him. I'll give you an example. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Paul told the Philippians, he says, you got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, right? 
He's talking about developing and becoming, you know, and becoming more of who God wants you to be and getting this thing down pat where you know how to live a Christian life in, you know, at work and in, in society and, and in places where people maybe don't appreciate it, but you know how to be who God wants you to be. He says you got to work it out with fear and trembling, having this great reverence and respect, knowing that, man, I can't play with God's life that he gives me. He says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good his pleasure. So God is saying, look, this, I, I, I am trying to work in you. I am, I am setting you up so that you can have a desire and put forth the necessary effort to do and be who I want you to do. You know, do what I want you to do, be who I want you to be. God's got a part that he does, but he requires us to put forth effort. He requires us to put forth effort. And we have to understand this, guys, that there's never been a person and there never will be a person who accomplishes God's will for their life. That at the end of your life and you hear God say, well done, who has not first put forth some effort. Because the winds of the world blow contrary to where God wants you to go. And you have to put forth effort in order to get there. You can't just go with the flow. I'm telling you, the flow blows contrary. One of the, one of the, one of the, one of a, a great example of this is I saw, um, I'm, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures to you. Let me read uh, Ma, uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 45 first. Um, so Jesus had been, had been teaching and stuff like that. And then the Bible says immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida. And he went and, and while he sent the multitude away. So he had been talking to all these people and teaching them and stuff. So he's going to send them away. And he told the disciples, y'all get in the boat. Go on to the other side over here, and I'll meet you over there. So they are doing, well, what is, his, what is the Lord's will for them at that moment? To go to Bethsaida, right? I want you to go to the other side of this river. Verse, Mark chapter 6, verse 48 says that Jesus looks up and he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth hour of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. So Jesus said, so here it is. We have the Lord's will for the disciples is to go to the other side of the, uh, the sea. That's what he wants for them. And we see the winds are actually trying to stop them, blowing against what he wants. Normally, you know, the first thing we say, man, if it's hard, then it ain't God's will, right? I mean, if it's God's will, it's going to be rose petals. It's going to be easy, you know, to win that my back. Not always. Yeah. So, you know, many times the, the, the tenor, the attitude of the world, the, those things are against what God wants you to be and become. And you got you to push hard, right? You got to do your part. See, I think God requires us to do what we're able to do, and then he does what we're not able to do. So they could roll and they could strain and it, it, and it was hard and maybe they weren't making progress, but they could, they could try. Are you with me? They could try and he requires you and I to try Amen. and to try hard. Lord. But it also causes, causes us that while we're trying, we're always trusting in, in him. And then he came out and walked on the water and he got into, you, you read the rest of Mark and you, and you, you see that Jesus came out walking on the, on the water, walking on the sea to him and he got in the boat and when he got into the boat everything chilled out. Now the disciples couldn't make the wind calm down but they could row as hard as they, as they could in their situations because they knew they had a mission that he wants us to go to the other side. And when the winds got rough, they didn't say, well, you know what? We're just going to let it blow us on back to this side because after all, oh, it's hard. I mean, God understand. He know how hard. He know how hard. No. He requires us to put forth effort. And we need to get that in our, in, our, in our heads, in our minds, in our hearts that if I'm going to accomplish God's will this year, yes. I'm going to have to put forth some, some effort. effort. Sometimes it requires more than others. But I got to have a clear mission and a goal of what he wants and then I got to push towards it. Are you with me? And, and I'll tell you this. You do your part. God will do what you can't do. And if you are trying, if you really are trying to grow and to become who God wants you to be and accomplish his will, there will be signs of growth. There will be signs of improvement if you really are trying. There will be. So let's, let's, let, let's, let's do a little quick inventory before we go further. We're at the end of a, end of a year, beginning of a, of a, of a year. Um, has your knowledge of God's word increased in the past year? What do you think? That's just you. That's, you, that's what you're thinking about. You know more about God's word than you did a year ago, right? 
Um, do you desire to know more about God's word at the end of this year than you did at the end of last year? Right? You have that desire? And remember, desire is only half, the, half of it, right? You got the desire, and then you have to put forth the effort. Right? And if you put forth the effort, you will see results. Because when you are working according to God's will, and his will is for us to have an understanding of his word. Because to know his word is to understand him and understand what he wants from us. And if anybody who puts forth effort for, to, that, to that end will always have signs of improvement and growth. Is the attitude of your life identifying more with Christ than it did a year ago? It's a general attitude of your life. And are you sacrificing a sufficient, a sufficient amount of your time and your life to serve other people? See, being Christian is not just about, um, some people had it a little twisted, you know, a long time ago. You go into a monastery, you go live up on a mountain, and you live by yourself, and I'm just going to be, you know, Christian. You can't be Christian without having an effect on people. You can't be Christian without serving people. You can't be, you look at what Christ did, okay, guys? And he served people. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, speaking about Christ says that how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about living on a mountain. No, he went about doing, doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. Now tell them the definition, uh, the translation here of, of, of what doing good is. And we've talked about this and those who, I mean, our little Bible study that we had, we went through Romans for almost a year or whatever. Um, but doing good, and in the Greek it translated means being philanthropic. Now that word philanthropic, you've heard it comes from the word philanthropy. Or somebody as a philanthropist means, you know, they, they got a lot of money and they're given to, you know, put money aside to help people and to do good for people. But Jesus didn't walk around with a lot of money, you understand? But yet he was being philanthropic because you don't have to have money in order to be a philanthropist. You got to just give of yourself. Yeah. You have to be willing to give of yourself to help out other people. And so Claiborne was praying this morning. Um, um, Melissa told you when Marie was praying and quoted the scripture and touched the heart. And when Claiborne was praying this morning during our prayer time, Claiborne um, was talking about, I'm about to lose my train of thought. I'm just wiping out just like that, right? Okay. Claiborne, what are you talking about? You're talking about something. What's Claiborne talking about? Right? All right. I'm going to think about it later. Let me get back to my notes. That's why I, get, I keep my notes, right? Because I will forget in a heartbeat. Because I got so many things I think about. All right. Anyway, you have to go about being philanthropic to helping people and doing good for other people. All right. That is a call. That is, in, you know, at the root of being Christ-like. Yes, it is about being pure. And we know we sang that song that uh, earlier about, Lord, purify me and clean my hands, right? I want to have a clean heart and a good attitude. And I want to be right in my, in, on the inside because that is very important. But it is not just so I can go once again, sit up on a mountain and say, look how good and clean I am. It is so that I can go out into society and have an effect on people and go out and serve. And what Clayman said, which y'all tried to make me forget, he said, Lord, I want you to let us use our our gifts to have a good effect on other people. See that? Right? You pray, Clay, you're praying for. I know you're praying, like, Lord, give it to him, give it to him. You're serious. That's, that's Clay there. Yes, indeed. But that's the thing, because God puts stuff in us so that we can be helpful to other people. Right? We, we read that Jesus, God anointed him with the Holy Spirit with power, and he went about living and using it, and, it's, and the Bible says that God was with him. Right? And so God wants to anoint us and give us the power and the ability to have a positive effect on other people, an effect that points to him. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Now here in the church, guys, I was thinking about this. Why we come to church, and, and, and for those who know, we come to church uh, a lot and all the time and come to church for years. We believe we're Christians, and I think you're Christian. You think I'm Christian. But the question is, do people outside of the church think we're Christian? You know? That's the question. Because right, it's easy to look like a Christian in the church. But do the people outside of the church think we're Christian? 
They should, right? Because Matthew 5, 14, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. That there should, it, it should be clear. I mean, I can't be brother so-and-so in the church and then out of the church and then I'm saying I'm player. What's up, player? Right? I mean, if I'm known as a Christian here, that, that people, no matter what, I, what my function is outside of this church, people should know that I'm a Christian doing it. Yeah. Oh, y'all understand what I'm saying to you? Yeah. Right? It's time. It's time to be serious about the Christian life. It's time for faithfulness to God because faithfulness prepares us to meet the Lord. I was, I was thinking about what the Apostle Paul said when he wrote his last his, uh, second letter, letter to Timothy. And in the fourth chapter, he said, uh, verse 8, he says, Finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. But he says, not to me only, but out to all those who love his appearing. But now if you read Timothy, what you find out is that he, well, Paul said something that's pretty famous. You know, you see it on funeral programs and things like that all the time. He said, before he wrote this, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. So when Paul talks about, hey, I'm ready to see God, it's because he had been faithful. And it's time for us to ensure that we are being faithful to God, faithful to what he wants us to do, faithful to his calling on our lives, because it's faithfulness that gives us the confidence that we'll stand before him and he'll receive us. And let's be honest. Paul wrote to the Romans here, he says, the night is far spent. You know what he's saying? He's saying, man, look, we ain't wasting too much time. And I, I don't even have to know everybody's personal story, but if you're a human being, you wasted, you wasted time. You've wasted God's time, right? Yeah. Wasted too much time. And one of the unfortunate things is that sometimes we don't realize how much time we waste until we get, you know, up in age and look back and say, man, I wasted a lot of time on frivolous things, on, on nothing, you know, that has not benefited me. Gave me pleasure for the moment, but no, nothing to build on for the future. I heard a guy say that um, something, man, he says, sometimes you, you start getting yourself together in life and start figuring out what it's all about, and it's just about time to leave. Right? I said, well, thank God that he gives you time anyway, right? Yeah. But that's why we got to get serious today, because we have wasted too much of God's time doing our will. I know I have. And you, did you notice what I said there? I said that intentionally, that we have wasted God's time. Because we tend to think that, you know, I got a life, it's my life, I do what I want, this is that, that. We need to see, and, and the reality is that our lives belong to God. That we are managers of this life for him. And so, you know, if you are, if you are a manager, and, and anybody, whatever, whatever uh, sector you work in, you know, when you, if you're a manager, then there are procedures that you have to manage by according to, right? Whether it's the plant, whether you're a school teacher, whatever you are, you have to manage. If it's, if it's not yours, somebody has set up a system of rules or regulations, and you manage according to that for them. This life is not ours. God has given it to us, takes it back any moment he wants to. And while we're here, we are required to manage it according to his rules and regulations. Right there. Lord. Are you with me? Yeah. It's time. It's time to make some fresh commi commitments to the Lord. It's time to make some fresh commitments. If not, fruitlessness, meaninglessness can extend from one year to the next. Yeah. Resolutions, are, you know, some people give up on them. A little sad that people are like, I don't want to make no resolutions, you know, because right, you know, they don't do anything. Blood. Resolu resolutions are great. It, it keeps us in mind that, you know what, that we need to be changing for the better. Yeah. It keeps that in our mind, that we need to be changing for the better. I mean, we, cannot, we cannot just go year to year because, like I said, if we don't have positive changes and we are not making fresh commitments to the Lord, we could, be, we could have uselessness that extends from one year to the next. And before you know it, you look back and it's 40 years and there ain't nothing but a desert, yeah. right? No fruit. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Amen. Amen. It's time to, it's probably time for us to lay some things aside. It's a perfect time to lay some things aside. 
some attitudes. You know, you got to check some, man, some, some attitudes that we had about some things that doesn't work for God, right? Didn't work for him at all last year, and it's a perfect time to lay it aside, right? It's time to lay some habits aside, some behaviors aside. Maybe TV shows, music, I don't know. But this is a perfect time to inventory ourselves and say what needs to lay aside that doesn't need to move into 2023 with me because I thank God I made it out. This didn't take me down last year, but I can't afford to have it go with me this year. Are y'all with me? Some people have to walk away from associations and relationships. Well, you never be free to live for Jesus and complete your mission. You got to be willing. You pray about those hard things, though, right? You know, I was thinking about this. And, uh, you know, the Christian that refuses to separate from, from, from worldly things, the things that God wants them to separate from, worldly influences, they're going to deny themselves of experiencing the best of God. Let me tell you, I'm going to show you a scripture in 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, the Apostle Paul writing and uh, quoting uh, uh, the Lord. He says, therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you and I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. When, when, I, when I refuse to, you know, to, to separate and from those influences that are really, you know, bringing out the worst. I mean, some things bring out the best in you. Some things bring out the worst in you, right? You got you to gotta recognize and stay away from those things that bring out the worst in you and try to, you know, embrace things that bring out the best in you. Because, look, because we want to experience the best of God. And I want to experience him as father, right? So think about this. If, if I'm experiencing God as father, then that means that everything my father has, then I begin to experience it in, in abundance or in sufficiency at the least. The joy, the peace, the, the protection, the guidance, the fulfillment, the satisfaction. Are you with me? Because, you know, if somebody has a father and he has resources, then they begin to experience him as father and they to be benefit from his resources. Right? We understand that, you know, got like, man, that, you know, that, you know we, we, were, we were laughing because um, um, when Donald Trump was uh, president or running for president or whatever, he was saying, they were talking about his business and how he started his business. And he said that uh, he started his, you know, he, he was a businessman, but, uh, and I, I was like, maybe you don't even understand, I guess, uh, you don't understand people like us. He said, yeah, I started my business. You know, I, I built it myself. He said, I just got a small million dollar loan from my daddy. So, no, from his father-in-law. That's uh, what his daddy, his father, right? That's right. So I told Melissa, you know, we talked to Greg, my father-in-law, and her daddy. And I told him we just need a small million dollar loan so we could, you know, come up. <laughs> right? But you see, Dad had resources, and he was, he was able to, you know, experience and live, you know, based on his daddy's resources. Well, God, he says, he says, look, I will be a father to you, right? The cattle upon a thousand hills belong to me. Jesus the one said, I have joy, and I want to give it to you so that your joy can be full. And if we experience in him as father, then everything that he has that we need will be ours at least to sufficiency and sometimes to overflow. Yeah. Are y'all with me? Amen. Right? But there's something that he requires us to do to experience that. So let's not sabotage our success. Amen? He says in verse 13, let us walk honestly as in the day, right? And not in all of these behaviors that are not becoming of being a, a son or a child of God. I think it's time to be sure that our behavior matches our confession, right? It is time to, that our behavior matches our confession. I just, I, I grow weary with people who want to have a confession of one thing, but live something else. It's like Christianity, it's like the only, only confession you can do that with, is with Christian. Be like, I'm a Christian, but you can't tell me what, you know, what it's like. Be like, your behavior ain't matching the Bible. You can't say nothing. Like, well, I don't, I don't see people saying that with elect, being an electrician, right? I'm an electrician. Could you change the life cycle? I don't know how to do that, but I'm an electrician. What? Nobody's, you know, I'm going to hire you anyway. No. 
It's like you gotta have the you gotta have the skill, the, the particular action that matches what you say you are, right? And, and it's definitely like that when it comes to being a Christian. And it's time, right? I don't need to judge you, and you don't need to judge me. We need to deal with ourselves. It's time that I make sure that my behavior is matching my confession in every situation especially when it'll spur the moment times when people are making me mad and they get me aggravated I need to remember my confession and make sure that my behavior is consistent with it right that's why I don't uh, get on people tail hardly no more in the car when they pull out in front of me you know what I'm talking about when you're going down the road and you see that car at the corner and they wait until you pass and they decide no I think they're close enough now, I'm gonna pull out in front of them, right? And pull out in front of you, and you just happen to be in a rush, and they just happen to not be in a rush. Whew, that was one of the hard ways to get right on them. And the Lord, like, so like, how is this, you know, how is this representing me, right? How, how is this, you know, you know, if they pull over right now, what I'm gonna say, yeah, you know, pray the Lord. So I had to, I had to, I had to like, kind of just deny that, you know? It's hard. You know, that's a simple thing, I mean, but this is what I found out about issues. Your issue is your issue. And sometimes people will say, I wish that was my issue because that ain't nothing. That's because it ain't nothing to you. Everybody's got something to overcome. Everybody got things that they got to overcome. And the last thing we need is to start making excuses for each other to stay down, but we need to encourage each other to rise up. Amen? It's time. I mean, look, we have to pray and work to see that our church attendance, our Bible study, that these things translate into godly living at home, on the job, in our social lives, in our relationships. Otherwise, they're meaningless. You know, if, if me coming to church and, and looking into the Bible, and if it doesn't translate to me being a, a, a godly husband and a godly father and a godly employee or employer and godly in my, in my relationships with people and just, you know, being the right type of person and, and treating people with dignity and respect, it being Christ-like. If, this doesn't, if, this, if it doesn't translate to me being Christ-like, then it's meaningless. Because this is not just, you know, like, God is not like, I just want you to go through motions because I'm all about going through motions. No, he wants stuff to change us and to have an impact on us. That's why it's our job to come clear-headed, ready, eager. Are you with me? Right? Look, I realized something, guys, that I had to look in the mirror and I said, you got to make this work. That God is going to give me the ability, he's going to do He's going to give me the power, but he is not going to do one thing for me that he's already empowered me to do. Right? I got it this morning and brushed my teeth, and I know that it is God that gives me the strength to brush my teeth. But I was going to be crazy if I was going to sit there and hold that, put that toothpaste and say, look, okay, God, brush my teeth for me. Right? Because he's already empowered me to do that. And you got to know what God has given you the ability to do, and he requires you to do it. Just like Peter and those rowing on that boat. The wind is against them. They're doing their part. They couldn't stop the wind, but they could keep rowing. You keep rowing. God will take care of the the circumstances. Are you with me? Diligence is required. You know what diligence is? Diligence is basically doing what it takes. It's doing what's necessary. You got to pray more, pray more. You got to call somebody to pray with you, get somebody to pray with you. Right? You got to stay away from certain things, stay away from certain things. Do what you got to do in order to, to be able to embrace godliness with cheerfulness and, and happiness and contentment. Do whatever is necessary. That's what God is saying. Now, it's time, and I'm going to uh, close in a second. It's time for Christians to see themselves as Christian first. And that's a challenge, you know, and it, it, is, it has never been more important in my lifetime for us to see ourselves as Christian first in all things. By design, your Christianity should outshine every area of your life. It should outshine and illuminate and loom over, uh, shine over every area of your life. Yeah, I've told you this before, but think about this. When we talk about Peter, the Apostle Peter, we don't gush about what a skilled fisherman he was. And I know he was a skilled fisherman because that was his livelihood. 
I bet that boy was, he was, skilled, he was so skilled when he had been fishing and they caught nothing. And Jesus came a little later talking about, hey, cash your net out. Peter like, man, we done washed the net. We've been fishing all night. I've been, you know, I've been doing this, you know. I mean, ain't no fish out here. And of course, Jesus said, I'm going to put some fish in the net. And they threw it out there. But Peter was a skilled fisherman. But we don't talk about that. Because his being an apostle, right, and a follower of Christ overshadows it. Are you with me? The apostle Paul was a, was a, was a skilled tent maker. Paul can make some tents. But nobody ever brings that up, really. You know, I mean, we don't really talk about, you hear about Paul, you know, you know talk about Paul the tent maker, how, how good he was at making tents, because he just laid it aside and his, and his, and his, his calling overshadowed that. Now, we may have, have callings as, you know, as, as great and magnificent as, as, as some people, as, as the Apostle Paul or Peter or maybe a Billy Graham or somebody, but we all are called to be Christian in all that we do and that whatever we do, we should be known as a Christian who's doing it. Right? Okay, so there was a guy that I used to work with, and I wasn't a Christian, but he was a Christian. I knew he was a Christian. I didn't know because I found him in church. I knew because I saw his life, and he had a confession, and he had behavior that matched it, and we did the same job. The difference was I saw him as a Christian, and, that was that, that, and he had accomplished his goal because he was a Christian working in that plant. Are you with me? Right. Having a career in this world is honorable as long as the career is honorable. You know what I mean? You can't be like, you know, you know I'm a hit man or whatever, something like that. But um, having, an, having a career in this world is honorable. But whatever you are, you should be known as a Christian who's doing it. And you should understand that when you make your decisions, before you are anything else, before you are black, white, Republican, Democrat, independent, uh, you know, American, uh, whoever, before you are anything else, you're a Christian. You gotta make that decision, first of all, as a Christian. Right? It benefits my wife that I'm a Christian first because I'm a Christian and then I'm a husband. And so I, tr I, I pray and I, and I ask God to help me to treat her the way she should be treated. Right? And so my relationship with her, my dealings with Melissa comes first from God, my Christianity. He, he affects me. And then she gets a beautiful husband because of that. Well, one better than what she would have had without me being a Christian. Right? And she could have been sad. We, we lived a couple of years. We, two years we, uh, we married two years before we both gave our lives to Christ and got saved. But, and she, you know, she, she, she would have probably lived with me forever like that, but I'm far better now. Right? And that's the thing that sometimes, you know, but, you know we can, what, what this is about is, look, let's not settle for less. Like, this is okay. This is the way it has to be. Jesus says, I came to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. Right? Lord. And she, she, for two years, she had a husband, and it was, you know, it was all right. And after Christ came into the situation, it went to abundancy. Uh, abundance, whatever. I don't know if I'm making up a word or what. <laughs> right? Y'all know what I'm saying. Take that off the tape. I'm just clowning. I'm closing, guys. Let me say this one more time. Having a career in this world is honorable, as long as it's an honorable. As long as the career can be, um, you can honor God by, while doing it. Um, it's not sinful. But whatever you do, you should be known as a Christian who's doing it. It doesn't mean that you preach all the time. It mean that, you know, you, I worked at, 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 uh, for the state for a long time. I didn't go in there preaching every day and preaching to everybody, whatever. But I need to make it clear who I was, right? Because this, you know, I'm the light of the world, and a city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. And so it was clear who I was. And God used that. Because right? that's what God wants to do. What he puts in you, what he gives you, starting with that light. He gives it to you to benefit other people. And so you have to be who God has called you to be. You have to embrace it. You have to put forth the effort. You pray for strong desires. And God will use you. Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine, so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So, in closing, I want to say that don't sabotage Christian success by catering to your flesh. That's a sinful nature. That's that bad part of us that everybody's got in them. 
We can't cater to it. And what uh, Paul said to the Romans that when we read, he says, put on the Lord Jesus and do not make provisions for the flesh. You know the things that make you weak. You know the things that, that you know, get you in trouble, bring out bad in you and stuff. You know that. He said, don't cater to those things. Don't make provisions for it. Right? Don't, don't create environments that are going to cause those things to live. And the, the easiest way to do that is in secret. Don't do those things. Christian success demands that we, that we deny our flesh. That sometimes we don't do things that we feel because we know it's not right. Or we do things that we're not feeling because we know it is right. It's denying the flesh. It's bringing it, in, in, bringing it into subjection. It's having a flesh, a sinful nature that said, look, I could, prefer, I could do without going to church, but you know what? This boy ain't going to let up, so you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, just, I'm just dead dragging along, and that's where my flesh has been for 20-something years. Just dead dragging along because you ain't got no choice. We going rain, shine, sleet, or snow. It may be hard at times, of course, but the reward is liberty, is victory, is power, is fulfillment, and it's overflowing joy. All of those things, because when we experience God as Father, all of his resources, everything that he has, is available to us, at least in sufficiency, and many times in overflow, in abundance. Amen? Amen. Let's make some fresh commitments. It's time. Amen. We stop right here.